Hi, I'm Meta Spencer. Today I get to get caught up with an old friend, Patrick Boyer, who is in his home in Bracebridge, Ontario, in a room that I would just love to go snooping around and see all these good things that you have in the background. Uh, uh, so Patrick and I have known each other in the Pugwash movement over the years, but I haven't been in touch with him a while. He's kind of off in cottage country living a life of solitude or maybe maybe he's not in solitude i don't know what kind of life he lives up there but maybe we'll find out at any rate the other day i happened to come across i don't know how that came to me but he he does a weekly show in cottage country <clears throat> muskoka area i gather it is uh, about uh, history of the region so I guess he's become a local historian. And the talk show he did the other day, was it wasn't a talk show, it was a, a presentation, a formal presentation of a history of the Spanish flu in Muskoka region. Is that right, Patrick? Yes, in Muskoka district, uh, this program, uh, well, the interesting thing is uh, that in January, 2020, I began this broadcast on our community radio station from Huntsville, Ontario, uh, and uh, talking about the Spanish flu and how it had impacted uh, Muskoka and Muskokans using this district as a case study of a larger phenomenon. You know, we, we talk about the big picture and the general principles, but things happen on the ground in real people's lives. Yeah. And so it's an easier way to impart a lot of understanding about a global phenomenon to actually look at real places and how it played out there. Well, in the course of doing that, I also had to talk about how the Spanish flu arose and developed and spread and uh, what it was like and, and so on. But that program in January 2020 was the inaugural show. Uh, for my uh, Boyer's Modern History of Muskoka. Mm -hmm. And it was really a couple months after that that we began to be aware of uh, a new uh, influenza that was spreading rapidly. Oh, and, uh, really you know, I thought, I thought the interesting way to, to help people, because uh, the, the program that you saw uh, just recently was after we'd all been subjected to a year of another pandemic. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I realized uh, that a great way to teach something, uh, and at, at first, let me put it this way, if I could. At first, a lot of people thought, well, that's just an interesting period piece, something that happened in times past. And, you know, it was quite gripping to see what happened in people's lives, the way that death was coming and municipalities had to respond because there was no federal department of, of health, no World Health Organization. It was totally different on the ground, Meta. But I thought, well, now that everybody's lived through a year with COVID and not only coping with it, but understanding it pretty well because we get these daily inundations of news reporting on it, right? Breaking news every 10 minutes. Um, I thought this would now be a much better way to teach by uh, uh, comparison. What, what is a global phenomenon like that we know so well today stacked up against one that happened a century ago? And so that was the basis of that uh, recent program or broadcast that you heard. Well, I, I thought it was absolutely fascinating. And, you know, to me, it's, it, it is also interesting that we, <clears throat> we know so little about the Spanish flu, or I will call it the Spanish flu, even though that's really a real misnomer, I think. But I'll, I'll call it that because everybody else does. But, uh, you know, I don't know much about it. And um, I remember hearing my mother uh, very rarely talk about it. Uh, she uh, would be 100, over 100 by now, well into her 100s. But uh, so uh, she must have been a baby um, at the time. Uh, but uh, I think it's, it's extraordinary in that we, so many people were killed and so many lives ruined. And yet 
we don't really hear that much about it, in my opinion. Uh, um, anything like, I mean, for example, I, I understand there are more people were killed by the Spanish flu than by World War I. Well, they were on equal scale, and it was basically 50 million people. That's the uh, number of people who died. Uh, there were many, many millions more who were infected and recovered. Uh, we're, we're aware today of those numbers, the number of people that get COVID and the number who die from it. Now, say um, again, how many died and how many caught it? Yes, yeah, so about 230 million people were infected by the Spanish flu and approximately 50 million died. Okay, now that's a, how many people have died of COVID so far? Worldwide, uh, uh, it's uh, about 2 million. Two and two po it's, it's, over, it's over 2 million. Yeah. So the scale, you know, different or even order of magnitude in a way. Yes, that's correct. And, and also you were hesitating about calling it the Spanish flu. And that's a very interesting point. And, and certainly you were right to, to kind of check because that, that influenza did not originate in Spain. Um, it, it came, it had been developing in uh, China and it was by March of 19, by February of 19, 18, the, war, the world war was still underway all, all around the globe. And um, in France, where everyone was in despair about uh, how badly uh, this war was going and how dire the consequences and how many dead uh, there were, um, uh, there were strikes in, in the factories in, uh, in France. There were shortages uh, even on the, the work crews of, out at the Western Front. And so the Chinese Labor Corps uh, came. There were, these were um, many hundreds and hundreds of uh, Chinese men uh, coming in crowded ships from China, even as uh, millions were dying in that country uh, across, the, uh, across the oceans to France and uh, bringing with them the flu. Now, and, did, uh, did the French know, did the world know in general, how no. much trouble there was in, in China? No, no. They didn't? They didn't no, they didn't have uh, real-time satellite broadcasts coming from around the world. It was a, it, on top of the fact that uh, the communication uh, was limited to uh, basically cables, cablegrams, and newspapers, uh, forget about everything else, radio, television, satellites, all that we're, worried, we're, we're so acclimatized to today. It's, it, we're talking about a totally different world uh, just a century ago. So they didn't know that. And indeed- now, but, what, but was the, gov the government of China trying to suppress the information? Well, today they are. But I'll tell you what, uh, in, in, uh, with the Spanish flu, it was the Canadian government that was trying to suppress the information. Really? Oh, Why? yes. Uh, Why? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll explain that, but I, can I just I'm going to finish about why it's called the Spanish flu. Yeah. Um, so the Chinese uh, Labor Corps arrived uh, in the French harbors and were deployed into the country. And uh, one of the attributes of that flu was that uh, it, it traveled, it, it, it infected most people in the age group 18 to 40, not older people, not children, but in that demographic, which was the perfect definition of the age of soldiers. Mm -hmm. And the soldiers were crowded into fetid, wet, uh, unhygienic uh, uh, trenches along the Western Front, all the way from the Swiss Alps to the North Sea, a, a, a gigantic incubator. And those that weren't in the trenches were, were crowded into uh, hospitals as wounded. They were uh, being shifted from one zone to another, from one country to another. Uh, they were in barracks and bivouacs and on, on troop ships and troop trains all of which were very crowded. 
So you know today, as everyone does, about social distancing and wearing masks and washing your hands and all of these efforts to reduce the spread of a virus. Well, it was 180 degrees opposite in 1918 and 19 and 20 um, because it wasn't really understood. And this point that you also uh, focused on a moment ago, uh, Meta, um, the governments didn't want to publicize anything, nor did the military relating to health or morale in the troops, because that would convey a vulnerability to the enemy. And so uh, it was absolutely prohibited under the Canadian army practices as the British and, and French and others. Uh, the, there were eight different empires fighting in that world war. Um, and, and so millions of people in arms all around the world, um, they, uh, they just clamped down on any information, whether it was about flu or mumps, which was very prevalent, or pneumonia, which was, and, and, and venereal disease. Like, apart from the French who were open about that, nobody else, the British, the Canadians, the Americans, once they finally got into the war, ever talked about venereal disease, but that was also a further debilitating de disease condition for a lot of soldiers in that war. So uh, the uh, desire on the part of the government and the army to suppress information was made a whole lot easier by wartime press censorship and the censorship of uh, mail between the front lines and the home front and the back and forth. I mean, the army's censors aren't, you know, armed with scissors would turn uh, some people's letters into looking like uh, paper dolls. Remember, we used to cut those all up. People yeah. would open envelopes and it's just shredded paper because there was no ability to transmit information uh, about what was happening. And so, sorry, uh, every soldier sending letters home in World War One would have from from the front would have his letter slashed. open open by a military uh, readers censors and censored, mm -hmm. and and they didn't black it out; they cut it out. So so what happened is that this uh, uh, influenza was spreading throughout Europe and into Spain part of Europe. Now, one of the very few countries that was not a belligerent power in the Great War, First World War, was Spain. And, you know, the doctors in the Iberian Peninsula were no better at diagnosing this than doctors anywhere else. However, <laughs> the Spanish newspapers were not under wartime uh, press censorship, mm -hmm. as we were. We, all, we had the press censorship in Canada under the War Measures Act, apart from the mail being censored. So in Spain, when they heard about all these people falling sick, they had some kind of influenza, they began to write stories about it, front page news. Well, this was the first place anybody in the world was hearing about this, this devastating influenza. And so it became called the Spanish flu. And that's how it has long since been referred to. It's mm -hmm. one of those perverse quirks of uh, yeah. historical uh, need to peg something on a place. Like in, in, in Canada, we know about the Dutch elm disease and we all yes. see our beautiful elm trees dying and we, we're, we're getting mad at the Dutch right? Well, no, well, it, it didn't start in the Netherlands. It was simply the Dutch are so good with their science and our, you know, their arborologists and arborists and so on. They were analyzing it and they came up with the fact that what it was, the kind That's of disease that was killing the elm trees. So it was the same thing, the Dutch elm disease, the Spanish flu. Uh -huh. Well, uh, of course, uh, sometimes there's an intention for pegging it with a particular country. I mean, uh, Trump was always referring to the China China virus or something. And of course, it, it, he was trying to create a sense of culpability that the Chinese 
had were evil because the the virus came from China. <clears throat> well, uh, just because it came from China doesn't mean anything <laughs> except that you know it could have started anywhere. And I guess the question is more like what can we do or what should have been done to contain it. I guess they didn't do enough right away, but they sure bent over backwards to try to contain it. Um, at least I'm talking about the, the current uh, virus, COVID, because they really tried to contain it very strenuously in China, uh, much more uh, vigorously than, than Canadians have tried to contain it. What was done, <clears throat> I, I, my impression is, and you can correct me, that, that a lot of the infection was spread by soldiers coming home and bringing the disease with them. Is that correct? And what what happened then in Canada or in the rest of the world as as soldiers brought this germ back with them? You're absolutely correct, uh, Meta. Uh, a troop ship uh, in uh, in uh, in 1918 uh, in in the summer uh, was returning uh, from Britain to Canada with wounded soldiers. All the soldiers who were being uh, invalided back to back to Canada. They, they weren't going to recover enough in British soldier in British hospitals uh, and Canadian hospitals in Britain uh, to be able to go back into battle. Many of them were, many of them did, but these were these were soldiers who were coming home uh, and carrying the uh, influenza with them. Crowded conditions on those ships uh, and, and, and all the rest. Uh, so basically every, every ship that was coming back from Europe into a Canadian port uh, from the mid-1918s uh, on was transporting people that, who had the, uh, the Spanish flu. Once they reached Halifax, the port of Halifax, they boarded trains and returned home all across Canada. And that was, uh, <laughs> you know, about our travel advisories and, and, and interprovincial uh, bubble barriers and all this. There was none of that back then. And so uh, here in Muskoka, for example, as a, as a few soldiers uh, were removed from the train and, and, and uh, into homes or hospitals, um, they, uh, a lot actually coming to Gravenhurst, which had the first, uh, tuberculosis sanitarium in all Canada. And so uh, it was treating, uh, soldiers who had, uh, mustard gas damage to their, their lungs. Uh, th this place was a bit of a magnet for returning soldiers. Um, and in Quebec, um, an outbreak of, uh, of significant proportions started with these returning soldiers at Saint Jean Military Base, uh, you know, in the in the eastern townships part of, of Quebec along the Saint Jean River, and uh, that fall it spread to uh, a an academy at Drummondville, and and the students and the staff, the teachers, were all coming down with this flu. And, and all that was happening from Ottawa and with the army was say, no, no, it's, 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 uh, it's not a serious il illness. People will recover. So what they did, they transported, all, they closed the Drummondville school because everybody was sick. You couldn't teach, you couldn't learn. And they all went back to their own communities across Quebec, where they come from, mm. oh. spreading it further. Brilliant. <laughs> yeah. And it just keeps going like I'm that. I'm sorry, but didn't they know better? I mean, didn't anybody realize? Of course they did. The word quarantine goes back to the Middle Ages. So people even, you know, 100,000 years ago probably knew enough to keep from traveling around spreading the thing. Uh, why, why didn't uh, Canadian officials know better? <clears throat> well, you're quite right, first of all, about the quarantine being something that would have be, has been applied for centuries. Like if there's a case of cholera or diphtheria or any communicable disease um, that was sent and the medical officer of health would order that there be signs put up around a home or a farm or any place like that. 
But the reason that no warning was given, no alarm or no prevention, is that uh, the Canadian Army in Ottawa was sending out messages, uh, press releases, press statements, um, that uh, this, uh, this current, uh, you know, that was called the gripe. They were kind of referring to it as like severe colds, you know, um, is, uh, is spread fast, but it's, it's not a serious consequence. And people quickly uh, recover. And, uh, and uh, above all, um, it's, it'll, it, it's fast passing. And so, so they absolutely were downplaying it. And when the medical officer of health in Muskoka, Dr. Peter McGibbon, wanted to close the schools in the district, uh, which we understand in present day, this is a big issue. Are the school is going to be closed because of the transmission? And now, excuse me, but would the young people have also been more susceptible to it? You said the, the most well, the first age I mean, would have been young young adults, but were school age children also affected more than they well, would be today? Well, <laughs> Dr. McGibbon thought that uh, it was a risk. That, you know, and even if they didn't uh, come down with it, they could be transmitting it, mm -hmm. something we know today, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but we did have cases in Muskoka, certainly documented cases where uh, mothers uh, uh, died with their uh, children. Um, and uh, so it was, and these were young infants, you know, so really young ones. But, but the point that I, that was important is that the uh, Ontario uh, Board of Health at that time, uh, told McGibbon, no, you cannot close the schools. It would be unnecessary, and it would be inconveniencing a lot of people, and we don't want to upset anyone in the communities. So, you, you know, it was denied. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is, we had uh, uh, no department of, well, there was no World Health Organization. There was no Department of uh, Health in Ottawa. Um, it actually, and, and the province was um, pretty much a hands-off uh, in terms of, of, I mean, they had, there were hospitals, the doctors, nurses, and all legislation. It, the, the provinces really were running social services and healthcare then, as, as now. It's just that Ottawa got, got itself into the picture. But um, the province itself was also following Ottawa's line in downplaying this. And, and the, the military uh, hosp ho base hospital in Toronto had, had issued a statement to all the Toronto papers that, uh, you know, this is, this is not anything that anybody should be worrying about. We've got it, we've got it. And, uh, and, the, and, and uh, 10 days later, that very base where people were dying and more and more succumbing to the illness um, of the flu was begging uh, other hospitals and other any for nurses. Mm -hmm. There was a huge nursing nur shortage of nurses, sure. just as we have today. Sure. One of the reasons for that being uh, Meta that uh, a huge number of uh, Canadian registered nurses had volunteered and gone overseas for the war. They were not on the scene back in Canada. Uh, you know, a quarter of our nurses were in Europe. Wow. And about 22 to 24 from Muskoka alone, a lightly populated district. Mm -hmm. so, so this was the effort of the government and the army to suppress information, to downplay it, and to hold back uh, any information about uh, stemming the tide. So it fell to municipalities to be the frontline authority, really taking things in, in, into under control. Mm -hmm. And so in the towns of Huntsville and Bracebridge and Gravenhurst uh, and the smaller villages uh, following, those municipalities here, they closed the schools, they closed the theaters, they put in a rule that nobody can go into the post offices while the mail is being sorted and put in your box, your mailboxes, because we don't want people jamming up in the lobby of the, of the post office. Um, but thinking. <laughs> there, were, 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, the Huntsville Forester newspaper kept publishing right through the whole period of the uh, Spanish flu in this district, but it came down to the, the editor, Harmon Rice, and one uh, typesetter, getting the two of them, getting the, getting the paper out every week, a thin sheet. It became a very thin sheet, but they did, they did report on what was happening. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, uh, this was a time when uh, the uh, celebrated Big One Inn was being built over on uh, Big One Island and Lake of Bays through the war, very hard, but the stone masons. What that is, by the way. It's, what it's, uh, it became the uh, largest and most prestigious uh, summer resort hotel in North America oh. from when it opened in the, in the early 1920s, 1922, June of 1922, until, well, it's still, until basically uh, the, the late 1950s. Mm. And um, it, it's, there's still life on that island, but, it, but at that time, uh, this this place was being built, but uh, they were having a, such a hard time getting workers that they had uh, from the the uh, uh, the stone masons that they had were falling ill and dying from the Spanish flu, and um, the uh, Bell Telephone Exchange in Bracebridge was basically shut down because all the operators had the flu, so people were not able to make very many phone calls. Uh, meat market was closed in this town because uh, you know everybody that worked there had died had, had, had was home sick. Uh, Peter McGibbon, the doctor um, who was our medical officer of health, he was also our MP at that time. Uh, he got the town to uh, take over a, a hospital or an, an apartment building, sorry, a, a hotel, a, a hotel in the town and turn it into an emergency hospital. What, like we see, you know, they did it first in New York and then in, in Britain where, and now we've got one in Toronto, a hospital that's exclusively for uh, now COVID cases, then Spanish flu cases. Mm -hmm. And uh, because you want the people to be confined in, a, in one isolated place, right? But they, they, what they were administering were still sort of we'd almost say they were home remedies you know they didn't understand uh the virology and the and the medical science hadn't uh, understood well but they didn't have a cure anyway even covid they don't have a cure it's like taking aspirin for for the you know uh, they don't have a cure uh and we just hope vaccines do the job but but the cure i mean and one of the things I was wondering is what was it a more deadly disease than COVID that or was it because there was worse care and worse um, effort to contain it than COVID? Because certainly the death rate, you know, the, the 50 million people is a lot worse. And, and I, I'm just wondering, um, how serious was it given if you had two two batches of people both one with covid and one with spanish flu and you didn't treat either one of them you treated them the same would a higher proportion of of the people with the spanish flu have died than uh with covid uh or are they equally dangerous if un uncared for properly well, that's an excellent question, and it's, uh, I would say they're equally dangerous. Just my own view is mm -hmm. that they're equally dangerous uh, and that it is very difficult to compare them because in the case of the Spanish flu, there was a huge effort to, to downplay it, to prevent information about it, mm -hmm. and uh, therefore allowing it to be communicated uh, rapidly and extensively around the world with also less ability to treat it. So now what we have with uh, the uh, COVID pandemic is uh, a, a lot of uh, publicity about it, warnings about it, restrictions on travel and, and closing down businesses and workplaces. Um, and, uh, and had that been done a century ago, um, and 
I'm, there's no question. There's no question that the death rate would not have been 50 million people on the planet. It would have been dramatically reduced. Yeah. So that it was a, que- a problem of containment rather than probably a difference in the amount of, of capacity to treat it once they caught it. Because, I mean, I don't think, I mean, like, I've told my friends, if I get it, don't don't put me on a ventilator. Just let me go, you know, yeah. because I don't think the ventilator thing, from what I've seen, would be helpful enough to make to make it worthwhile, given that it's horrible experience. And I, so I don't think there's of course, they did give uh, Trump some extra juicy kind of pills or whatever that seem to have helped him. And I gather there are some treatments now that help, so, you know, help people get quicker, get better quicker. Uh, but um, I'm not, sh- I don't think there's any, there's certainly no cure or treatment that's, that's, you know, wonderful. Although the death rate I gather is going down in COVID now. Uh, well, well, the, um, your point about the ventilator is an, an interesting one, uh, Meta, because there is has been some secondary findings that, uh, in, in in certainly in some of the cases, uh, being on a ventilator was not a plus; it was a negative. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, they didn't have the, ventilators then, though, did they? No, not yeah. no, and 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 uh, in in nineteen eighteen, in, in September of nineteen eighteen. There was an 18-year-old Canadian soldier in in, your, in Europe, uh, um, a gunner, and um, he, he had some flu. He was coughing a bit, uh, kind of like cold symptoms, but he toughed it out because that was what was being pushed. You know, stiff upper lip, you know, carry on, macho thing. You know, you don't give in to anything. And so he, he spent a couple more days, you know, where he was. Uh, they were outdoors. They were in some rain. It was cold. It was getting in the fall. Uh, he was, they had, so they were playing some soccer and he was playing that and kind of getting sweating and hot out in this cold and damp area. And it, it aggravated his condition. Uh, and he ended up uh, in the infirmary. And uh, in, a, in the course of the next uh, 10, 12 days, uh, the coughing got much worse. His temperature went up to 103 degrees. Uh, yeah, he couldn't stop coughing. Uh, he started to, he was having difficulty breathing. He started uh, uh, bleeding from his, his nose. Um, the tips of his fingers and his toes were turning blue uh, because they were not getting oxygen. Uh, his his uh, breathing was very labored and strained. And then after uh, about four or five days of that kind of suffering, clearly not able to eat or anything, uh, getting, you know, he's just totally incapacitated in, in his bed. Um, he really is starting having a hard time breathing and uh, he's gasping for air. And uh, in his medical record, so as taking as many as 50 breaths a minute. That's like almost a second between them. And if you start just gasping for air like that every second, yeah. you can you can understand the panic in that. And because his lungs were no longer able to absorb oxygen. Mm-hmm. So all his reflex reactions in his, in his body and from his brain were telling him to, you know, breathe in that air. But all he could do with these little gasps was, was not enough. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, three doctors attending him and deep into, a, deep into the night, he, he finally died and they just watched. There was nothing they could do. And that was one specific case of, uh, you know. Um, and would you say that was the kind of the set of t- the typical symptoms uh, those the other people would have had much the same experience. Yes. And I think, I think it's uh, you, you, another point you just mentioned there, uh, Meta was about uh, uh, treatment and, and whether the death rate w- w- uh, uh, was greater because of lack of treatment or 
whether people, more people could recover if there was treatment. Well, if we go back to the, the world's greatest pandemic, which was the Black Plague, the uh, bubonic plague that spread, uh, you know, in the 14th century for over eight years, it let, you know, people are wondering when, are, when is COVID going to be done? Uh, the, that bubonic plague lasted through Asia, North Africa, and, and Europe uh, for eight years. And um, with, uh, you know, basically an estimated 70 to 200 million people dying which was a huge slice of the world's population then. Mm -hmm. And if, uh, if uh, someone uh, succumbed to it, um, they uh, not know if they, if they contracted the, the plague uh, without treatment, uh, they would be dead, you know, within as short as three days. Um, and, or they could hang on to about 10 days. But the, the numbers between those who were treated and not treated, um, the death rate was uh, uh, very high for those who had no treatment. And uh, it was uh, about 30% lower death rate for those who had any kind of treatment. Really? Yeah. So, but, but what, so what, what, what was the treatment? I mean, what would they have done? Well, it's the a totally sickness. different kind of disease from, from COVID or the Spanish flu, right? I mean, they're not, not at all the same kind of uh, virus. No, right? no, no, that, that's correct. It, it, it was not a, it was not this type. It wasn't a viral yeah. uh, uh, d disease. Uh, but the, the point is that we're talking about a pandemic. And that term used by the United Nations now really is to define any kind of illness that spreads from, you know, in, yeah. through the community and, uh, and through many enough countries that it's really globe encircling. You know, if it's just, if it's just in one province or one part of one country or something, it's a, nap, a local epidemic. Right. But um, that's the terminology. And, and uh, so what we basically are looking at here is, uh, any era is getting the best treatment that they've got available, right? So yeah. in the 1400s, um, that would have been separating people and, and, and trying to reduce the contagion, the spreading of it, um, um, whatever else they, they, they did back then. Uh, it, it made the simple point, and I guess this is the takeaway from all three of these pandemics, the the Black Death in the 1400s, uh, uh, Spanish flu a century ago, and now COVID, with treatment and precautions, you're better off than without any of that. In other words, treatment treatment helps. It may not... Even if treat, you don't really treat. know how to treat people, doing something is better than doing nothing, okay? Yeah, and, <laughs> and being, up, being open and, and upfront about it, because that was the other big problem with the Spanish flu, the effort to keep it, because of the war in particular. Mm -hmm. This was happening at the time of war, and it was the back end of that war when things were really getting dire. The British Empire ran into it thinking, oh, we'll be home by Christmas. Wow. So did the Kaiser. He said they'd be home in Germany before the leaves of fall were on the ground. Uh, but after the, the millions of people in that industrial slaughter house of, of the great war, uh, it, there was so much despair that this, this thing was going to be lost, that all of the sacrifice was for nothing. Mm -hmm. and, and the losses were agonizing. And so uh, it was a time of great despair and, and those in command were trying to make a final big push with, with a lot of very reluctant people. That's we ended up with conscription being brought in because of this. Uh, despite the prime minister's pledge at the start of the war, there would be no conscription. It was, that, it was just such a wrenching uh, evil enterprise that was underway with that war. And, um, well, I, so, uh, although you're surely right in pointing out the, the importance of the fact that this ep pandemic took place during the war, it is also the case, and as a sociologist, I'm slightly aware of the research that other sociologists of disaster do, 
not very aware of it, but one of the main findings they, they come up with is that in general, when there's a disaster, people, officials will play it down almost invariably uh, in, the, in publicity. They will uh, almost always say, don't worry about it. We've got it handled or it's not going to be too bad or et cetera. And their rationale for it is generally that, look, we don't want to uh, frighten people because if people get into a panic, it's going to cause more trouble than the problem itself, which is not the case. The truth is that the average person is more likely to go into denial all by himself than, than if you told the truth. So, for example, you can go up and down the street with a bullhorn on your car saying, flee for your lives, or the dam is about to break, or, you know, some other catastrophe is going to occur, and people will sit in their homes and say, well, I don't believe it, and, and they won't leave. Uh, and that tends to be too much the problem, more the problem than than anything else, getting people to take seriously the warnings, the threats, the admonitions, et cetera, that you've got a, a real problem. People tend to deny. So- Well, I think it's, uh, those are very valid points. And I think that when you extend that uh, sociological analysis to what happens over the course of a year, and say in the province of Ontario, you look at how people responded to the first close down uh, back in you know March, April, May, and what and and now uh, when there's more uh, desire when people are pent up, they've been closed in, they they're they're getting beside themselves and they want to get out or do things, mm -hmm. and but most people are still serious about how they've got to protect themselves. But we see a growing resistance, right? Um, because there's that other kick thing that kicks in is how long can people live? You know, how many times can you hear them calling wolf, wolf, you know? Mm -hmm. you know? And, and uh, so it, 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 we're still in a very dynamic situation with this. And uh, the, uh, the streets in Toronto, I remember being there, uh, and, and they were like bowling alleys, you know, on, on a closed, closed on a Sunday morning, like there were no cars, no people, you know, but, but if you travel around the city now, not, not the same, not the same. And, and there's a lot of reasons for that. So, yeah, I mean, we've got the deniers uh, who are always a problem. Uh, and, and I would say that, you know, if we can compare the way that China has been trying to hide information about COVID, uh, compare that to the way Ottawa and the Canadian Army and other countries were trying to hide information about it a century ago. Mm -hmm. Well, we could compare the, the deniers, uh, you know, to the people like uh, former President Trump and current Prime Minister Boris Johnson in the initial period in, in Britain, who were downplaying it. And I think... Mm -hmm. It wouldn't really be the case in uh, Donald Trump's uh, behavior, but I think with many others, it is what you say, don't alarm the people. Yeah. And that was certainly the case with the Canadian government. Don't, let, don't, don't get people worked up because then they'll have a reaction that's very bad. And, and when that I was, was teaching... A, it's just a very wrong notion and, and officials should be cautioned not to make that assumption because in general it's it's not true you know people do not panic by by and large they if anything are resistant to to doing the uh, precautions that uh, make obvious uh, sense well it would be a great thing to live in a political society would it not uh, meta where the political leaders treated the the the, the population as as being adults <laughs> It would be a great thing to live in a society where the population were adults. <laughs> so, so the way well, people are voting right now, the you know we we don't have time to go into the impeachment trial in the Senate, which is going on at, as we speak. But you know you see when the representatives of of the people 
of being absolutely oblivious to any rational considerations uh, because the most they'd be, be voted out next time. And, and that means that most people do not use good sense. I'm sorry to put it so bluntly, which has got to the point of making me think, well, do I really believe in democracy anymore? Can anybody really believe in democracy anymore, given well, the kind of idiotic uh, behavior that voters display? And what have we got instead? But that I'd like to have another conversation about that. <laughs> it's not all right, <laughs> we'll, do, we'll do that because we must continue to believe in democracy. Absolutely, we must. We and must, we, what we else? Need, it's not working. It's not working. It look no, at it. Because, <laughs> well, uh, you're, you're, you're talking about the United States. Your, your example was about the United States. We have our own problems with democracy in Canada, and we need to stop touting that we're one of the world's great democracies when increasingly we diminish the ways in which we conduct ourselves as a truly democratic society. And, uh, so this goes to electoral reform. This goes through changing the way the House of Commons operates and many other things. The fact that we have municipal councils in Ontario that are elected once every four years, every four years. It used to be in Ontario, councils were elected every year. I see. On January the 1st. I see. And, and you tell me the difference between being thoughtful about your, the, your voters and your citizens and being accountable to them on a 12 month basis or on a 48 month basis. And, it, we, 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 in, in, and those are just a couple of the many examples, Meta, of how we have diminished the actual living exercise of, of democracy and democratic accountability in our country. And uh, it's a lot of this has spread into the culture. You know, it's, it's, we can't have a democratic society unless within our, our culture, we have those values and people really are living according to them. So, and I think that does come back onto the, how, how we're being treated and, and, treat, and we are treating uh, this pandemic. And I, the point I, I think I was trying to make, and I guess why you wanted me to be with you to, on this program was to be able to look at our, get a clear and dispassionate view of our present circumstances by seeing where we have been before and what's improved and what hasn't and how do we account for those differences? Because we are, we're not little islands in time. We are part of a much bigger mainstream flowing of, of people and beliefs and values and attitudes and memories and medical science and sociology. Uh, and it all comes together here on uh, save the world with a, Meta Spencer. Thank you. You're so sweet. <laughs> and, and as somebody who had a shot at becoming prime minister a few years ago, I think yeah. your po position is uh, one that we should take seriously. When you talk about how to democratize Canada a little bit better, improve our the state of the world, uh, everybody ought to listen because you know what you're talking about. And I appreciate that. It's wonderful you, to be back in touch with you. It's Thank wonderful you. to talk to you. So bless your heart and carry Thank on. <laughs> Take care. See you. Bye. Bye-bye.